We're here today with uh, uh, Dr. Eric Lowen, who is the incoming president of uh, the American Nuclear Society. Good morning, Eric. Good nice morning, to have you Chris. with us. Thanks for having me today. We are delighted in every possible way. Eric, we want to talk today uh, about you. We want to talk about what, you, uh, what you've done in your professional career, your educational career. Talk about what life is like as Eric Lowen. Um, we also obviously want to um, inquire into your thoughts about the ascendancy of Eric Lowen as the president, how you view right. the role of uh, the society in the nuclear community. Let's just start by hearing a little about your background. I had the opportunity to grow up in the world's highest incorporated city, which is called Leadville, Colorado. A lot of people say they're from there, but I can truly tell you that I grew up there. Good stuff. Uh, my dad was a door-to-door -door salesman, so I had to behave probably a little bit because obviously if you uh, had a little bit of mischief that could hurt a potential customer. And so in that town, uh, I had a unique opportunity to have a wood business, I delivered papers, and then uh, for some reason my dad shipped me to a farm in Kansas where he grew up and I had to work the, the summers in flat, hot, uh, southeast Kansas, um, turned my keep so I could ski. The town allowed me to do a lot of skiing, which I parlayed into a ski scholarship at Western State College in Gunnison, Colorado. And that's where I really started on my scientific career with a, a double major in uh, chemistry and mathematics. How did you go from uh, skiing to chemistry and mathematics? Um, I had a science, high school science teacher, um, uh, Mr. Marta, what's his name, who just uh, made science come alive. And so ANS does similar sort of things where we have teacher workshops at our national meetings where we try to give our te those teachers the tools they have so they can excite kids about science. That's great stuff. So I don't think Mr. Marta attended an ANS uh, teacher's workshop back in the day, um, but, uh, but that's the sort of things that we need to do as a society to engage high school teachers so that we can continue to put kids into science. That's important, yeah. Now from, from your undergraduate career, I understand you entered the United States Navy. Yeah, somehow in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, I heard a calling to the sea. I don't know if it was a seashell or something that uh, was there. So the Navy recruiter came on campus, and initially I was uh, interested in flying jet airplanes, which I think many people are when the, they see the Navy recruiter come on campus. And he looked at my resume and said, that, oh, you're a science major. Here's this different program. Please apply to it. If you don't, you can always become an aviator. And, and I realized that that would probably be a better choice, and so that's where I headed into the nuclear Navy program. The uh, I've heard you tell a great story about um, going into a, a classroom setting uh, in the Navy, in which you uh, you could tell what your career, your future was going to be by where you sat uh, at the front or the back. Do you remember that story? You told it to the to the Correct. students at the CCNY. The uh, nuclear power. So you go into the Navy, go to officer candidate school to get your commission. So that's four months. Or so, and then you go to nuclear power school, and the very first day you arrive on campus, if you could call it that, you took an exam, and by the next day they had graded it, and that exam score determined where you sat in the class. So the smartest person in the class sat at the back next to the door, and we had six sections, so you had six smart people, so it's hard to tell. And then the less intellectually able sat towards the front. So yours truly was one away from the front door. So I wasn't the dumbest, but I was in the next cut below. And, and I would say some of it was because I went to a liberal arts college and had, uh, you know, I was taking pottery and some music classes, and I was competing against engineers and went to schools that have t football teams that show up on New Year's Day, okay? Mm -hmm. So it was just, but what the good thing about the Navy is is that you put forth effort, you can get, uh, you can catch up with your peers, and, and so that first six months in the classroom is a little bit tough. I understand. The, um, the, the role you played in the Navy uh, had an impact uh, for your future career. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit? The Navy teaches you how to run a naval, naval nuclear propulsion system. So it's a pressurized water reactor, both GE and Westinghouse developed those reactors depending on what ship it was. And so it's a fantastic technology that can do great things to, for our national defense. But all of that is classified. So I 
like the technology. I wanted to do more in the technology, and it came towards the end of my commitment to the government. And so I resigned my commission from the president to get out. And basically it was because I had the opportunity to serve in the Persian Gulf for six months, escorting Kuwaiti oil tankers in 1986, 87. Mm -hmm. And just realized that that's, you know, I want to use a positive benefits of nuclear power. So I set a goal back then to build a nuclear power plant here in the United States. And I'm happy to say that uh, my year as president will probably be when we, you know, truly cut the ribbon for the power plants that are going to be built in Georgia and South Carolina, BC Summer and Volvo. So, you know, I think this is a, you know, you know, I feel very fortunate to see that happen under my watch as ANS president. That is going to be an exciting time. Absolutely will. From, um, from the Navy, uh, what was the next step? National labs or back to school? After the Navy, I needed to go get a degree in nuclear engineering so mm -hmm. that I could say that I learned this from a civilian side because everything I knew was classified. So I applied to three different schools um, and chose, so the three schools, just for the record, were uh, University of Tennessee, Purdue, and University of Wisconsin. And the technical work was about the same, and the pay was, of course, the same. <laughs> So I needed some sort of discriminator to pick between the three, so I'll go on record in front of all of ANS now. And I picked Wisconsin because you could ski. And it turns out the largest cross-country race in North, North America, the Berkey, mm -hmm. is in Wisconsin. So I thought, well, I'll go there. Now, Good. I didn't tell my advisor that at Wisconsin. I told him I was very excited to work on plasma processing. But uh, that's how I ended up at Wisconsin and then got my master's degree, started working on my doctorate's degree, then left for an opportunity in private business for four years, and then returned and finished my PhD at Wisconsin. Other than the Berkey, what was the okay. most memorable experience from your time at Wisconsin? I became a father. So my uh, daughter was born in Madison, Wisconsin, and that's where I be started becoming a family man. So that's where, that's probably my best memory. Nice. Very good. Uh, we're, we're going to stay talking about you a little bit. Um, one of one of the great skills that you bring to um, to the society um, is your abilities at, at communication. You do it wonderfully. You engage all the levels of the audiences um, uh, before whom you present. Tell us the secret. What what is it that makes you so successful? I like to share technical information with people, mm -hmm. and it started very early in my career. So after I finished the Navy training program, um, I went back to my high school science teacher's class. Mr. Martin had the opportunity to talk about nuclear power in a, a non-classified. So you know that's probably my first public uh, discussion that I had, if you mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been involved. So in the Navy, I uh, was selected to be an instructor for a year. And I always took the opportunity to, to give classes. And one of the things I did was on the Navy ship, we had training that we were required to do that was, it was on a cycle so that you kept current on different things. And I became an ANS member. Mm -hmm. And as you know, eating the same food day after day, you, you kind of get used to it. But if you had some salt and pepper, it tastes a little bit better. So what I would do on different subject areas is I'd go read through my nuclear news magazine and find some tidbit or some information that was related and put that in or talked about it. And that salt and pepper, if you will, in that training program, you know, led me to be one of the better um, trainers on the ship because all officers were required to do training. And so I kind of gravitated towards that. I understand. After I got out of um, then at University of Wisconsin to get a, a doctorate degree, you're required to have a technical and a non-technical minor. And the non-technical minor, they're trying to get you to the other side of the campus to take um, classes. And I think it's because we're getting paid to go to school as engineers that I mm -hmm. think the liberal arts wants us to go over there. So I can say that since I have a Bachelor of Arts undergrad. So I just thought, you know, why not do a different program? So I challenged the graduate school and I asked them if I could do an outreach program to reach, a, um, I forget what I called it, but it was to, to communicate non-technical, communicate technical information to the non-technical public. So I agreed to the amount of schools I would see and the teachers, and, and so I went around Madison in any classroom that would have me to, to talk about that. So I had uh, kindergarten where I sat with kids talking about atoms on a very simplistic level with a bunny. 
sitting on my lap because he had a class bunny that got to hop around and as of course it would gravitate to the person that really didn't want anything to do with it so it had to sit on my lap and I had to s smile all the way to uh, you know college chemistry class there in Madison so I did that that's a great story um, uh, your role as an educator now you were at Idaho National Lab and I think I understand that at the same time you were an adjunct professor at Idaho State University could you talk a little about those experiences and, and how communicating was important um, in fulfilling your, your duties there? The great opportunity to work at a national laboratory is very much aware of their responsibility to communicate, to reach out to the community. Mm -hmm. So Idaho gave me a great opportunity to go um, around the state and speak on either technical research issues I was doing or broader issues of what the national laboratory was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was done on your own time, and, you know, they awarded that volunteerism, you know, every year with a breakfast. And, but, well, but it was because the National Laboratory has different roles, and they have to be careful how they use their people and what they need to do, so it was purely voluntary, so I gravitated towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the National Laboratory also is looking for you as a scientist to be in those leadership roles as an adjunct professor. So I did that at University of, or Idaho State University and also University of Missouri Rolla um, in those roles of trying to work with students. So I didn't teach per se in the classroom, but I was involved as an associate professor with um, Idaho National Laboratory employees that were working on their PhD, so I was on their committee. So that was my role. I understand. For, for them. Let's move, let's move forward. Uh, as I say, this week you will take over the gavel uh, to be uh, among the youngest presidents of the American Nuclear Society. So, Fritz, who is the youngest president of ANS? Well, we it's to know funny that. you ask, and I was just, of course, working on the, um, uh, that compendium, which will become the history of okay. the American Nuclear Society. Walter Zinn is, that of is course, the, the name that comes to my mind. He was 32, which I think is extraordinary. There is actually a side story that I'll share. Um, he did actually have a falsified birth certificate. He was 33 at the time. Okay. This okay. is a little known okay. fact, which I have delved from the Vatican archives. Okay. We'll move on. Okay. <laughs> so the toss-up question. This week, uh, you will take over the gavel as the uh, among the youngest presidents of the American Nuclear Society. Uh, Let's talk about how you view the challenges that you'll face, but also what excitement that you expect um, during this, this year. We've already talked about cutting the ribbon on uh, a new plant in the United States, but what are your thoughts about the, your ascendancy? I obviously have unique times because of, of the tragedy that happened in Japan to, to you know, the country of Japan with a very large earthquake and the tsunami. So in my role, I want to continue to reach out to those people that were affected. The American Nuclear Society has set up a, a relief fund. Um, to date, we've given over $150,000 to help those that are around that Fukushima plant. So I, I view, because it's on my watch, it's my responsibility to continue to do our efforts there for the society. We also have set up a special committee uh, by Chairman Klein and Professor Cordini to get into the details and I realize that there's a lot of different entities and organizations that are doing their own reports but we're we're distinctly different because we're a national we're a professional society that archives things for multi-generations and so it's important for us to start the due diligence to collect those facts those lessons learned that will be numerous and consolidate those to, to what I'm looking for is to really be the compendium or the report that people will look to 15 years from now of saying what did we learn how do we need to do things differently and so a point of distinction is is if I can summarize um, the scientists and engineers who are members of ANS who are members of the Commission will put together a report which is completely dispassionate in its results and that it will be the place that everyone from scholars policymakers, um, the American public, uh, the international public would go for the, the facts of what we know about Fukushima as time goes on. 
Correct, but Fritz, that's only one part of it. So as a technical society, we also had journal publications. So you're going to see a lot of the scientists, be it at a national laboratory or in Japan or university, start doing experiments or investigating or doing analysis, and that will also capture in our nuclear, in our scientific publications. From our commercial publications, they have the ability to continue to report on that through nuclear news. So there's more than just this special committee for us as an opportunity. And the last challenge that I just gave to the public or the publication steering committee is, who's going to write the book? And I think when we look at going forward, if you see some of these larger events like Paul or other sort of things, there is the book that is written. So why not, you know, I threw the challenge out, why not have ANS write the book? So it's technical versus integrated with that human story, and how do we apply the right sort of resources to be the ones that tell that story? Because I've just finished a book on uranium, I forget the author's name, and what happened in that book is towards the end, there was a lot of facts that were wrong, and a lot of facts that were very biased against our technology and what we're doing. So it just seems like we as a technical society can put some of that human story in there to have a compelling story on the book. So that's broadly what we need to do as a technical society to be able so that from generations from now we can document that the earth is a dangerous place to live and that we need to make sure that we understand the dangers on earth and how do we protect this technology from that. That's a great point. Uh, we, we look forward to seeing much more about that. Okay. Now. Your, as you say, your, your tenure will be informed considerably by the events in, in Japan of uh, last March. But surely the, the role you'll play will be much broader. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the messages that, that you as president want the members of the uh, American Nuclear Society to hear? And then we'll also talk about some of the messages uh, that you want policymakers to know the American public to know uh, K through So let's 12. first start with messages to, to the society itself. Correct. Um, during the way that we run in competitive offices for president is we have a statement. So in that statement it really codified what my expectations are and that is for the society to go back and digitally record all of the publications back to our founding in 1954. We have those in hard copy in our headquarters, but we have not taken the responsibility to get them into the next medium where we need those. And so that's the charge that I've put on both the divisions and staff that we need to get that done to apply the right sort of resources so that we have that digital archive. And I think it's important we do it for all of our journals, then we head into the space of picking up our commercial publications like Nuclear News. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the people that's helping me in the society has been Holtzman. It would be great if he could pick up a 1955 issue of nuclear news and read about the plant that he may or may not work at, at Westinghouse. So those are the sort of things I think that we as a society need to be responsible for. If we build up that infrastructure to be able to capture it electronically, we have a lot of members, um, unfortunately they're reaching their time on earth if you will, and they have some original documents that aren't in those libraries, some letters and stuff, and so that we can reach out to those people and say, hey, we can digitize this. So it won't be, you know, you've saved this since you've retired. You've saved this for two, three, four decades. Here's how we can preserve it forever. And that's the sort of thing that I'm asking, you know, our executive director to how do we build up that infrastructure so that we have that sort of service to do. So that's, and the other message to the members is that I've spent a lot of time on writing some letters to all the committee chairs, which are really the cabinet of the president, if you will, because you're, in, in the office of the president, you pick who the committee chairs are and who's on the committees. And I've asked them to do a variety of things, and I've also asked them to talk to each other. Because I had the unique opportunity to meet with all of them in Las Vegas and really saw that we're not communicating as well as we could. So that's uh, what we're doing there. Let me just, now, probe, as as, let me just probe that a okay. little bit. Um, it sounds to me that you are really embracing um, technology that's available to us today as a tool for better communication. Is that fair? That is fair. So you would then, um, you would, in, in furtherance of communication with the membership, we can look forward 
to an embrace of once again all of the all of the tools that are available social media as well as the more conventional communications from the from headquarters in the form that has been done in the past would that also be fair do you think that's fair yeah good but let, let's be clear i mean our when i took over as when i had the opportunity to lead as treasurer i went mm -hmm. to tour the ans facilities and had the opportunity to see our um, server room mm -hmm. which was one pane of glass away from the parking lot and uh, through that sort of interaction and working with the executive director that room is now inside of the building away from one pane of glass in a very secure environment mm -hmm. with proper locks and air conditioning and when i look at our physical capabilities we have them okay and, and joe koblick is doing a great job as far as that goes it's really that software piece to get what sort of software we need to do. And in the case of archiving journals, you need some physical assets. Mm -hmm. And anybody can PDF anything, but it's really how detailed do we want it? Do we want to make everything searchable within that PDF document, or do you just want to make the, the title and the authors and those sort of things? So it's, it's, we just have to harness what we have. I understand. Let's talk then uh, about messages, back to that. Um, you were a congressional fellow uh, for ANS uh, some years mm -hmm. back. Um, you then therefore bring to your presidency a perspective that has not perhaps been shared by some of your predecessors. Um, what do you, how do you view your role and the society's role uh, in communicating with policymakers? So I view my role as I'm in the office of the president. So in that role, ANS needs to be the ones that, that is called on to testify on the Hill. So our previous uh, Joe Coven was up there this spring, and I look at the year to come, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for the Office of the President, if you will, to take those opportunities to testify in front of Congress, be it the House or the Senate. So that's one of the things I can bring, having been on the Hill as a ANS fellow, to bring that sort of perspective because I was on the other side of the dais helping a senator get ready for those particular hearings so that I can help there. Also, we need to, as a society, you know, really reach out to the different policymakers because we had some, you know, the new plant construction, small modular reactors, and then how we're going to approach policy regulations post Fukushima. And so I credit President Obama of not taking a knee-jerk reaction. It's been very calm and positive that we're going to take the diligence to look at the lessons learned and not make any radical changes to the nuclear industry that is safe here in the United States. And that would be the key message that you would like to, to make sure Congress gets? It, yes. Our nuclear power plants are safe. Plants they operate in Japan are safe. Um, as engineers, we are expected to design to a certain limit. They did that. Now, in hindsight, we can say that it wasn't high enough. And can we spend more resources to design to that one? Sure. But when you look at, say, Fukushima, and we spent another billion dollars on trying to improve that, because right now there is nobody that's been killed due to the, to the core damage that's occurred in those three reactors. So if you spend another billion dollars there, we could make it better or something that, that wouldn't have occurred. But when you look at the tens of thousands of people that lost their lives because of their infrastructure wasn't going to hold up. How is, as a society, where is that money better spent? So that's where we need to have that realism in that we built a very good structure. We have, we continue to operate those and, and you know, where as a society do we want to put those resources? How different from the message you just described directed to policymakers? would be the message or messages that you would like um, the American public to, to remember from your presidency? I'd like the, the American public to remember that we started the construction officially of two nuclear power plants, or really four nuclear power plants, at two different sites in either 2011 or 2012. And that becomes the United States is committed to diversifying its energy supply, hopefully electrifying its transportation, and realizing that nuclear power is part of the solution for energy supply in the future. And it's a little bit disappointing that we've shifted so quickly to say that um, gas fracking to get natural gas is going to save us, and, it, and it, 
it bothers me that we haven't learned our lessons from the past, like in 1973, when you lock into one particular energy source, you have a common cause failure that if that supply gets disrupted. I think the one thing that people should always remember is you need that diversity of energy supply. So that's the one thing. Also, I'd like to see uh, the success of the small modular reactor program the Department of Energy is doing. And then also kind of like kind of that closure of the Fukushima event so that people can see that, okay, yes, this is the best sales tool for nuclear power. Here is the worst sort of thing you could have done to it. And still, it's safer than any other sort of energy supply that could have been out there. Very good. We talked earlier about you with the bunny on your knee and, and uh, talking to first graders. Um, education is, is key to, a key component to um, the mission of the American Nuclear Society. In a perfect world, what would you have different about education for elementary school kids uh, about nuclear science and technology? What would you change that would help those students when they become citizens and adults uh, view nuclear energy in the way that you look at it? In that context, I would like to change the bias that I see in textbooks. So I've had two kids finish high school, their chemistry textbook, when they have the chapter on nuclear power, they have the emotional picture of a Chernobyl child or a Chernobyl person. And when I look at the other chapters in that book, when they talk about acids, I don't see hydrofluoric acid burns that kill people. When I look at the organic chemistry section, I don't see benzene giving people liver cancer. So when you look at our textbooks in America, it's very biased against nuclear science and technology. So those are, if you ask me one thing to change, is to take that bias out of the textbooks. And, and I see that, you know, kind of across the board in the different school districts that I've operated in. You know, they tend to like those pictures and they put those emotive pictures in there that, uh, of things, but they don't put that on across the other suite of chapters. We'll go back to that when we, uh, when we do the bit about the teacher workshop, okay. uh, but keep that in mind because that, that's excellent stuff. We'll expand on that to talk then about the other side of the, the table, namely how do we go to teachers. Okay. But that, like I say, we'll save that for later. Um, let's now talk about uh, the world post Fukushima. How do you see the mood of the nuclear uh, science and technology community as a result of what happened last March? I see the mood of our nuclear science and technology community is one that wants to learn. And what we want to do is to understand as much as we can and see what sort of things we could do differently or better or that provides some incremental cost a little bit but provide you know a huge amount of margin as far as the coping margin so the ICS is very bullish on the technology that we're a learning organization and we still see the need for nuclear science and technology in this world and when we look at energy sources there's two fundamental energy sources in the universe fusion and fission and so we as humans needed to continue in our quest to, to be able to do that. So, you know, we developed as humans because we learned to harness this energy called chemical energy early on in our development process, which we call fire. And now we have the unique opportunity because of the work of um, Walter Zinn, the first president of ANS, to turn into electricity to use instead of chemical energy to use binding energy. And that's energy inside the nucleus. And so that's really, I think, the grand challenge for humanity is to say, let's transition now from chemical energy to more binding energy because it has a lot more environmental benefits.